that will be. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. Brother Tommy, are you on your way, please, sir? And he is on his way. I tell you what, let's do. Let's have a word of prayer for him. And then when he gets here, well, the Lord will help him preach for us. All right? Father, thank you for our men and women that are here tonight. And Lord, I just pray that you'll open up our hearts and minds. And I pray that you'll help us to love one another more than we ever have. And then I pray that you'll help us to take the scriptures, take it with us to the world, take it to this city that we live in. I pray that you'll bless Brother Tom as he speaks tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, Brother Tom, you come and speak, and you just uh, end the service the way you want to, okay? All right, good evening. We are going to be in the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 1 this evening. I spoke to you a few weeks ago on the subject of what kind of fool am I? And we looked at what God or what the world says a fool is. And as we look at our passage here tonight, you'll find out that there are two categories of fools. The world's version of a fool and what God says a fool is. And tonight we're going to focus on a God, a fool in God's eyes. First Corinthians chapter one, beginning in verse. 18. For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and will bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this world? Hath not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? For after that in the wisdom of God... The world, by wisdom, knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. For the Jews require a sign, and the Greeks seek after wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified under the Jews' stumbling block, and under the Greeks' foolishness. But under them which are called both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. Because the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. For you see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. But God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. And God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty. And base things of the world, and things which are despised, hath God chosen, yea, and things which are not, to bring to naught things that are. That no flesh should glory in his presence, but of him are ye in Christ Jesus, who of God has made unto us wisdom, and righteousness, and sanctification, and redemption. That according as it is written, he that glorifieth, or he that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. Heavenly Father, as we look into your word tonight, I pray you will speak to our hearts. Thank you again for everyone that's here, for their faithfulness. And I pray, Lord, for those that are unable to be here for sickness, I pray you'll give them healing. I pray, Lord, that for those that are traveling or on other reasons that they could not be here, I pray that you will just bring them back as soon as possible. But Lord, for those that just decided not to be here, I pray you'll convict them of their need to be in your house. For it's in Christ's name we do pray. Amen. Now again, as we talked about it a few weeks ago, there are two categories of fools that we can see in our passage. Now there are all types of fools. but There's two main categories. A fool in the world's eyes and a fool in God's eyes. And whether you like it or not, whether you want to be called a fool or not, we all fit into one of those two categories. Either the world says you're a fool, or God says you're a fool. And the world looks at us. They look at each and every person that's here tonight, and they say, you're all a bunch of fools. They think it's foolish that we would come to a church on Sunday morning, Sunday night, and Wednesday night to listen to preaching and worship a God that we cannot see 
a God, a God that we cannot touch, a God that we cannot feel with our hands or our, our, our flesh. They say, that's, that's foolish. You're fools for doing that. They think that we're foolish and we're a bunch of fools because we give of our time and our talent and our tithes to support the ministry of the church. They think it's foolish that we put our trust and our faith in this book. The preaching of the word of this book. Because they look at it and they say, you claim it's the infallible, inerrant word of God, but it was written by men. Men are flawed. They're not infallible. Therefore, this book is a waste of time. However, they disregard the fact that this book was inspired by the Holy Spirit. Yes, God used men to write it, but God gave them the words. This is God's word. But they say that's foolish. The fact that you would put your trust, your faith, in a Savior who died on a cross to save you from your sins, who died and was buried and then somehow you believe he was risen from the dead? They think that's foolish. Once you're dead, that's it. They think all of this is a bunch of nonsense. And I've heard people say it many times. I think you're nothing but a fool. That's the way they look at us. Now we talked about that last time, but tonight I want us to focus on who God says is a fool. You know, I would rather be a fool in the world's eyes than a fool in God's eyes. And I think when we look at this, we can get a pretty good picture of who God says is a fool. Now, first of all, we're going to look at the first thing, and that is the unwitting fool. When I talk about an unwitting fool, that's a person that just doesn't know any better. Now, remember... When we talk about a fool, we're not talking about somebody that's silly. We're not talking about some kind of buffoon. We're not even talking about somebody that people would say is stupid. It has nothing to do with intelligence level. It's not about being silly and crazy. To be a fool just means that you're unwise. And doing foolish things means you make unwise decisions. You base those decisions on what you know. So, the unwitting fool is going to base his decisions and his actions on what he knows. And that's worldly wisdom. He doesn't know God. He doesn't know anything about it because he has no relationship with God. And therefore all of his decisions are based on what he does know. Worldly wisdom. If you go down here and you look again in verse 21... It says, for after that in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. There are a lot of people out there that just don't know God because they have no relationship with God. They don't trust God. They look at it and they say, why should I trust somebody that I don't know? He, I've never proven God. Now you think back, you say, well, that's, that's, that's crazy kind of talk, right? But you think back to David and Goliath. You remember, you all know the story. David's going out to face this big giant Goliath. And Saul gives him his armor and says, here, put this on to go face the giant. <clears throat> and David says, I'm not going to do it because I'm not proven this armor. He's never tested it. He's never tried it out. But what did he know? He knew God. God had been with him when he faced a bear. God had been with him when he faced a lion. He knew God would take care of him, even against this giant. But see, the world that doesn't know God, how can they trust someone they don't know? Surely, yes, yes, they've heard about church. They've heard about the Bible. They probably have a head knowledge of God, but they don't have a heart knowledge of God. And part of that is our fault because we haven't got out there and told them. We haven't shared with them the word of God. And the world has such, done such a good job of ingraining them in their way of wisdom that when you try to approach these people and you try to share the gospel, they don't want to listen to it. 
They say, that's a bunch of crazy talk. So they don't know God. They just go by what they do know. And that's the, way, the worldly way. But the worldly way will not get them to heaven. The worldly way will not save them. The world's wisdom will do absolutely nothing for them. They are fools in God's eyes. So that's the first person that we see is the unwitting fool. Then we come to the second type of fool, and that's the educated fool. The educated fool would be someone we would maybe consider a humanist. They've gone to school, and they've become indoctrinated with the world's wisdom. <coughs> they've listened to all the experts, the professors in school. They've had all of these things hammered into them since they were little. And so they've gotten educated, and they've gotten more and more knowledge from the world. But when they get all that knowledge from the world, it leaves very little room for knowledge of God. Because they become hardened to the things of God. All they put their trust in are things like logic, reason, science. That's what they focus on. And some of the things, when you look at it in the Bible, it's illogical, isn't it? How could the sea part? How could the dead rise? How could this ark hold all those animals? I mean, you look at all these things and say they're illogical. It's impossible. And we look at the virgin birth. How is that possible? Well, you know what the Bible says. For men, it is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. They say, no, no, that's crazy. No, no. Show me the science. Prove it. But here's the thing. They put all their stock in science and in reason, and yet they put so much faith in theories. The Big Bang Theory, the theory of evolution, and I could go on and on and on. There's no proof of any of that. Someone that was an expert, someone who wore a lab coat, someone who said something, someone who posts something on social media, obviously they know more than the people of God. They have all this knowledge and they get it in and they become indoctrinated. And what they do, they take that knowledge and what they're doing right now, they're trying to get our kids at a very early age and indoctrinate them in the worldly wisdom to keep them away from the things of God. They start telling you that church people are dangerous. God's people are the real danger. I saw something the other day, there was something in the Department of Justice said, the real danger in America is white Christian men. Those are, the, those are the terrorists in the nation. While they're putting on drag shows for our children, in libraries, in the schools, and inviting in all this homosexuality and all these things that go against the things of God. They're bringing it in and they're trying to tell you it's okay. It's just an alternative lifestyle. And they're getting our children acclimated to that. They're indoctrinating in that. But they say what religion is trying to do is indoctrinate them. We're trying to share the truth. That's what we're trying to do. But the educated person has no room for that. They disregard religion. They say it's nothing more than a myth. That's it. A fairy tale. There was a singer a number of years back. You may have heard of her. Madonna. Was very popular back in the 80s. And she was talking one day about her children. She said yes. And she comes from a Catholic background. But she said she was going to share the Bible with her children. That was very shocking to hear her say that. I said, wow, maybe there's hope for her yet. But then she said, I'm going to tell them it's just a fairy tale like all these other things they read. See, they believe in themselves. They look at them, us as humans as being gods. Religion's just a myth. God is just a myth. God has chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. Say, the wise person, the humanist says, it's foolish for someone to die for your sins. That's foolish. 
But God said, I'm choosing this foolish thing to save those that will believe. So they look at the cross as foolishness. They look at the crucifixion as foolishness. And those that would put their faith in it as a bunch of fools. So then we go on and we look at the next fool. And that would be the religious fool. That's the third person. The religious fool. Now you say, well, what do you mean? Well, it says here in our passage that the Jews were looking for a sign. The Greeks were looking after wisdom. And they looked at Christ crucified as a stumbling block for the Jews and under the Greeks' foolishness. See, the religious fool is one who's looking for signs. They're basically going to church and playing church. And they believe because they go to church that that's good enough. Because they believe that there is a God. They believe that if I go to church and I serve in the church, I put money in the plate, maybe they've even been baptized, that all of that will be good enough to get them to heaven. They're not fools. They're just religious. But I can tell you this. Church membership won't get you to heaven. That both baptismal waters will not get you to heaven. And I don't care how much you tithe. It won't get you to heaven. If it did, uh, probably nobody in this church is going to make it. I'll just be honest with you. Now I know the Catholic church at one point, I, I had a friend of mine that had a, a calendar he got at a funeral home. It was a Catholic church calendar. And it said, don't forget the church and your will to ensure your spot in heaven. How crazy is that? You're dead and gone, you give money to the church, you're going to buy your way into heaven. It's too late, my friend. It's too late. And they say that we're fools. But there are all those people, because I've served in a church, and you may have served in a church for a long, long time. Our pastor has been serving in a ministry since Noah had the ark. No, I'm kidding. He'd been serving for quite some time. Since he was 18 years old. Been serving, even before that, but preaching since he was 18. But that won't get him to heaven. I don't care how many people you witness to. It won't get you to heaven. See, that's about works. It's by grace are you saved through faith, not of works, lest any man should boast. So no one can stand before God and say, look what I did. You have to let me in. No, he doesn't. If you read your Bible, Jesus even said that many would stand before at the great white throne of judgment and say, Lord, didn't we cast out demons in your name? Didn't we do all these things in your name? He will say, depart from me. I never knew you. See, religion will not get you to heaven. But there are a lot of people who come to church and give and even serve. And some people even have titles. See, you can be a Sunday school teacher, it won't get you to heaven. You can be a preacher, it won't get you to heaven. You can be a deacon, it won't get you to heaven. You can lead the music, you can play the piano, you can serve in the nursery, you can do all of these things, it will not get you to heaven. It weighs no special favor with God. None. But that's a person that is a religious fool. But there's also those that are religious fools who want to mix worldly wisdom with religion. What they want to do is make some kind of hybrid religion. That's what they'll say. Well, we accept certain things in the Bible. We accept the blessings of God. We like all the good stuff. We want to have certain ceremonies and traditions. But we like what the world has to offer too. And what they want to do is they try to mix the two. You know one of the things that they've started doing now? It, came, it started a few years ago. We had the creation people and the evolution people and they didn't mix, right? Well now they try to mix it. They try to use evolution to explain creationism. They said it didn't happen over a period of six or seven days. No, it happened over thousands of years. And they want to use passages like 
One day with the Lord is like a thousand years. You see, see? It, we can make this work. And they want to do all these different things to bring worldly wisdom into the church. They tell us that we have to change to get people to come in, to be more receptive. What you have to do is change your music. Change the way you dress. Change the way you talk. You have to change the entire service. You have to be lights and show and smoke and mirrors and all these things. You've got to go out there and you've got to put food out there to get them in. You've got to get out there and you know, you're trying to reach this certain group. You've got to act like this certain group. So if they're in a bar, I guess you've got to go drink if you're going to go minister in the bar. If you're going to go out here, you know, whatever, you get the idea. That's not the way it works. See, we're to come out and be different. And the world says for us to be different is foolish. But God says, you being like the world is foolish. So we've got those that are looking for signs, that are looking to be working in the church. They're mixing worldly wisdom with religion. And those that want to do all of these things, Matthew chapter 23, Jesus described these people as blind guides, hypocrites, and fools. That's what he was saying to the scribes and the Pharisees, the people that were putting worldliness in the church, the people that had positions that were sticking to the traditions of the church. Now when I talk about traditions of the church, we're not talking about the traditions of preaching the word. They're talking about doing things the way they've always been done. Like, you can't do this and you can't do that. And then they would change the rules. Because, you know what, they were doing those things, but they, nobody else could do them. You get the idea. The rules apply to you, they don't apply to me. Because I'm in a position of leadership. I somehow get an exemption. So these are foolish people in the eyes of God. Jesus called them out. He said, you're fools. So then we get to the fourth person. And that would be the uncertain fool. The uncertain fool is what we would look at as someone who's probably agnostic. They're not sure that God really exists. But they don't disallow the fact that there could be a God. Now this is the kind of person that will go about and say, well, I can't see God. I don't know that God really exists. But just in case, let me say that prayer. Well, first of all, they cannot say that there's no proof of God. Paul tells us in the book of Romans chapter 1, verses 19 through 20, or 22, that even the things around us, creation itself, cries out about the existence of God. You say, well, I can't see him. Take a look around. Look at the trees. Look at the sky. Look at the cycles that we go through. Spring, summer, winter, fall, all of that. The fact that you're breathing should tell you that God created us. He exists. Look at things that cannot be explained. How someone who's been told they have cancer, then they go back to the doctor and somehow after prayer, that cancer is no sign of it. It's gone. They say, well, that's, we can't explain it. Science can't explain it. Doctors can't explain it. God can't. God's people can. How can people go through such tragedies and still have joy in their life? God. He exists. He gives comfort. He gives strength. He gives grace. But the agnostic says, I'm not so sure. But again, they want to kind of hedge their bets a little. They want some fire insurance. So what they do is, someone comes up and they say, do you know if you die today, you'd go to heaven? They really don't believe there's a heaven. They don't really believe that there's a hell. But just in case, they say, well, let me show you how you can get there. And they say, take their Bible and they'll look at it. They don't, probably don't pay attention. But they say, say this prayer with me. And they say the prayer and they say, okay, I'm good. I've got my fire insurance. That prayer meant nothing. I've known people. I've known people within my own family who said, I don't believe in God. I don't believe in heaven. I don't believe in hell. But 
just in case I know I'm good because I said a prayer when I was a kid. You know what God says? You're a fool. You're a fool. You're an ignorant fool. You're uncertain about God's existence. Can there be any doubt God exists? For us, we would say no. But for them, yeah. So then we get to the last person that we're going to look at tonight. And that's the fifth type of fool. And this is probably the most egregious of all the fools. That's the arrogant fool. The arrogant fool. That would be one we would consider to be an atheist. The atheist, the arrogant fool, is someone who's absolutely defiant in the face of God. They come out and say, absolutely, there is no heaven, there is no hell, there is no God. But, as we read the book of Psalm, chapter 14, verse 1, this is what God has to say in the Bible. The fool hath said in his heart, there is no God. That's what God says. A fool says, I don't exist. They don't want to believe in heaven. They don't want to believe in hell. They don't want to believe in a creator, a God. Because if there is a God, if there is a heaven, if there is a hell, then they have to submit to that God, that authority. They have a choice of heaven or hell. They don't want to do that. They don't want to submit to anyone's authority. I was in the military. As you all know, I was in the Navy. And one of the things that you hate in the Navy is having to submit to authority. Because sometimes you have people that are in leadership over you that just, well, let's just say, they're not the most competent people in the world. They get promoted and things happen and they are in positions they shouldn't be, but they get there because of their rank or their seniority and they're horrible. But because they're over you, they're your boss, they tell you you have to do this, you have to do it. If you don't, there are consequences. You get written up. You can go to mass. You lose money. You can spend time in the brig. All those kind of things. And it's everywhere. You go into the workplace, we all have a boss. Even if you're your own boss, you work for somebody. You might work for your customers or whoever. And when someone with authority comes in there and they tell you what to do, sometimes it grates, doesn't it? It just goes against the grain. You hate it. Because you don't want to have to submit to this authority. You want to do things your way. We get that way in the church too. We don't like people that are in authority over us. We don't want to listen to them. We want to do things the way we want to do it. When a preacher gets up here and he says, you need to be faithful to the church. Oh, I don't like that. You're stepping on my toes, preacher. When they say, you need to be in Sunday school. Oh, I don't like that. I don't like getting up early. You're stepping on my toes. And if you do it enough, I'll just leave. I'll go somewhere where I don't have to put up with this. You get the idea. We just do not like anyone telling us what to do. It happens in the home. That's why there's a lot of friction in the home, trying to figure out who's the head of the household. And we all know who the head of the household is. God says the man's in charge. But mama runs the show. That's just the way it is, right? We're in charge, but mama runs the show. Because a happy wife is a happy life. You make the wife unhappy, you better watch out when you sleep. Better sleep with one eye open. No, I'm kidding a little bit. But we even have that. Kids don't want to listen to their parents. They say the parents don't know anything. They lived in a different age. When it, was all, it was all easy back then. They had to put up with the things we did. Wives don't really want to... They, ladies, I know you, but y'all don't like that verse in the Bible that says, wives, submit to your husband. You don't. Admit it. I'm not asking you to raise your hand, but if you're honest, you'll say, I just don't like it. I don't like the idea of it. But that's what God says to do, right? You know, that's why we took the word obey out of the marriage vows, because that's what that word submit means, obey. We took it out because... 
I'm not obeying anybody. See, we fight the authority. That's part of that sin nature that we have in us. We're just defiant. And that's the person here that says, I don't want to submit to God, so I refuse to believe that he exists. And if I refuse to believe that he exists, then I don't have to worry about the consequences. Heaven or hell. This is it. And we all know people that are like that. They say there is no God, there is no heaven, there is no hell. And God's looking at them and saying, you fool. But not only is the arrogant fool defiant, the arrogant fool is self-reliant. Self-reliant. I want you to turn in your Bible to the book of Luke, chapter 12. Book of Luke, chapter 12. We're going to look at verses 15 through 21. Luke chapter 12, beginning at verse 15. Make sure I'm in the right spot. Okay, here we are. And he said unto them, Take heed and beware of a covetous man, for a man's life consisteth not in the abundance of things which he possesseth. And he spake a parable unto them, saying, The ground of a certain rich man brought forth plentiful. And he thought within himself, saying, What shall I do? Because I have no room where to bestow my fruits. And he said, This will I do. I will pull down my barns and build greater. And there will I bestow all my fruits and my goods. And I will say to my soul, Soul, thou hast much goods laid up for many years. Take thine ease, eat, drink, and be merry. And we'll stop right there. This is a person who said, Look, I've got it all. I've got so much, I'm going to tear down my barns and put even bigger barns so I can hold even more. I did this. I don't have to depend on anyone, just me. So I'm just going to sit back, take it easy, and rest on my laurels because of what I have done. But in verse 20, it says, But God said unto him, Thou fool, this night thy soul shall be required of thee. Then who shall those things be which thou hast provided? So is he that taketh up treasure for himself, or layeth up treasure for himself, and is not rich toward God. See, that person who thinks, I've got it all, I've got enough, they put their faith in things. They put their faith in money. They put their faith in a position. Say, look, I've got it all. God says, you're a fool. Because you know, it could be taken away just like that we looked at the rich man in Luke chapter 16 verses 19 through 21 the rich man and the beggar you know the story the rich man thought because he had all this money all this wealth he was eating the best food he was dressing with the best clothes he had the finest house he said I got him made he was relying on himself and nobody else and then he died and the Bible says, in hell, he lifted up his eyes in torment. And you know what? God's saying, you fool. See, we get to the point where we start saying, I have to rely on no one but myself. Now understand this. I know sometimes it's hard to ask for help, isn't it? I'm one of those people. I'll tell you, I struggle with it. I tend to depend on myself for a lot of things. Things around the house need to get done. I don't ask anybody to do it. I do it myself. Why? Because I know if I ask somebody else, they're probably going to let me down. And that's a lot of things that happen. People come up to me. When I was at work, I was known as the go-to guy. You needed something done, you came to Tom. Why? Because Tom got it done. You could ask other people, and they just wouldn't do it. So people would come to me. They would bypass all the bosses and all that, they come straight to me, hey, can you help me with this? Sure, let's go get it done. Now, I don't mind doing that. Sometimes it can be a little frustrating, okay? But here's the thing, what I've learned, I'm not in it by myself. You know, I say, God, you're going to have to help me with this. I need you. I need your strength. I need your grace. I can't do it on my own. People will let you down. God never will let you down. But I don't care how much stock you put in wealth, how much stock you put in 
all of your things, all of the big houses, all that, none of that will get you to heaven. None of it. You can say, well, I got a lot of money. Well, what happens one day when you get sick? Now, here's the thing. Well, none of us are getting any younger. And whether you like it or not, I don't care how old you are, how old you think you're going to live to, at some time, at some point, your body's going to give out. That's just the natural way of things. The body decays. It gets old. It breaks down. And sometimes we get sick, and that doesn't help. All the money in the world won't keep you from getting sick. Won't keep you from getting a disease. All the things in the world won't keep you from being in an accident when you leave here. None of that matters. I was thinking about it today. I don't know if you remember back on Channel 10 News, way back in the 70s, they, there was a guy named Carl Williams that used to do the news. Well, this was back in Knoxville. I was looking up. But for some reason, I'm sorry, what, that guy's name was Carl. Let me look it up. He retired. He was, he's in his 90s now. But guess what? That's great. I don't care if he lives to be 100. At some point, he's going. He's going to die. It's just a natural order of things. And your money won't do you any good. Your things won't do you any good. Putting your faith in yourself will not do you any good. You can't just will yourself to continue on. The only thing that's going to help you is God. And those arrogant fools who defy God, those arrogant fools who rely on themselves and ignore God are nothing more than fools. So I wrap it up with this tonight. There are two categories of fools. A fool in the world's eyes and a fool in God's eyes. The question you have to ask yourself, the question I have to ask myself is what kind of fool am I? Would you stand? We'll pray and we'll be dismissed. And thank you for your attention tonight. I appreciate it. Be back on Wednesday night. We'll be continuing with our Wednesday night prayer service. Invite people to church. Call people that haven't been here in a while. Again, they expect the pastor to do it. They expect myself, the deacons. Get on the phone and say, hey, I missed you. Come on in. We'd like to see you again. All right, let's pray and we'll go our way. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for your love and for your grace. And I am thankful tonight, Lord, that that day, many, many years ago, when I was nine years old, that the, I heard the preaching of your word. And I was convicted in my heart of my need for Jesus Christ. And since that time, my faith has been in this word. My faith has been in Jesus as my Savior. And because of that, I know I have the assurance of heaven. The world may think I'm foolish. The world may think we're all here tonight foolish. But I pray, Lord, you'll give us a greater burden to share the truth with them that are fools in your eyes. For it's in Christ's name we do pray. Amen.